While Senator Levin leads one of the most important committees in Congress, respected and likable may be words more closely associated with him than power broker. Levin has served in Congress since 1982, representing the 12th District of Michigan, which includes parts of Macomb and Oakland counties in suburban Detroit. The Washington Post calls him the lesser known Levin because until now, his younger brother Carl Levin, Senator from Michigan, has historically gotten more ink. But Senator Levin has worked quietly behind the scenes for years building expertise in labor and trade policy. In March, he took over as the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee when then chairman Charlie Rangel of New York stepped down due to ethics concerns. Now, Levin oversees every tax, trade, social security, Medicare, and employment measure that moves through Congress. If there's major money involved, the bill goes through Ways and Means. And there's a lot of money flowing through Washington these days. With the powerful position comes a place in the history books. With Carl chairing Senate Armed Services, the Levins are the first brothers since the 1800s to serve simultaneously as committee chairs. This year, Levin has said the economy is job number one for his committee. And he's ready to take on one of the most controversial tax issues of the day, whether to extend the Bush era tax cuts. Other issues include looming shortfalls in Social Security, trade with China, and helping U.S. businesses become more competitive. He's the father of four, and his daughter Jennifer, as noted, is here with us at the head table today. He's also reported to be a mean squash player and a Red Wings hockey fan, which has been difficult in recent days. The National Press Club welcomes Congressman Sander Levin. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me and my daughter, Jenny. Um, I can't remember the first a session or meeting or event my late beloved wife of 50 years, Vicki, and I took Jenny to. I'm not sure she remembers, but I can remember her at our house in Berkeley um, on the stairway uh, as we had meetings. And she was two or three years old, and she would just stay there listening intently. And so she's here today. And I hope, Jenny, you won't be bored. You're still looking at your dad, and he's still looking at, looking at you. I decided to focus my remarks essentially on matters before our committee. I thought that might be appropriate. If you would like to ask any question unrelated to Ways and Means, I will turn my cell phone on and text message my brother. <laughs> so I, I, I have it here, especially if it relates to armed services matters and others. He's investigating beyond armed services today, as you know. You know, as I sat down to write my remarks, I thought, um, what were the events of the 27 years that I've been in the Congress? My colleague Dennis Hertel is here. We served together. Butler Derrick, we served together. And I remembered, uh, I came in the early 80s, the recession, uh, the end of Soviet power and domination. I remember well the debate over the health care bill in the Clinton years. I remember very vividly the Republican takeover of the House. Of course, 9-11 and the war in Iraq. I remember also going home in 1993 uh, after the deficit reduction vote uh, that passed, as you remember, just by a sliver. And we made the mistake, I thought, of having a town meeting. I love them all. But in a place in Warren, Michigan, in a shopping mall with a very low ceiling, and I can still hear the reverberations. It was a rather turbulent meeting. But as I began to write my remarks, I decided that this is different. And so here's what I wrote down. In a democracy, every generation or so, there occur conditions which can be described by what seems a rather strange label a perfect storm. It's defined and uh, 
one of the staff dug this out of an internet. I won't mention which place. In quotes, a rare combination of circumstances that aggravate a situation dramatically. And this volatile combination today includes, and let me just run through them, I think you all know them, and some of you report on them, the deepest economic recession since the Depression, a historic financial meltdown receiving more and more attention, the globalizing of our economy more apparent every day, all of them impacting the families that I represent in the communities, suburban Michigan. Secondly, Bush administration policies that contributed to a historically high level of income inequalities, upper income families doing still better, and middle class families essentially as stagnant in their incomes. Amidst a historic increase in the national debt, replacing what were projected budget surpluses. And third, and being on the committee, I remember uh, these issues so well. Neglect of public programs intended to provide safeguards for families in need. A disgraceful example, and it's so vivid in Michigan. The doubling of the Social Security dis uh, disability backlog in eight years. Hundreds of thousands waiting two or three years or more for a decision and an unemployment insurance system that has too often failed to help jobless workers. And last, U.S. trade deficits, the largest in recorded history, twice as large as the previous record in the 80s and a major drag on our economy and a, contribute, a contributor to the global crisis. So when such a combination creates, in quotes, a perfect storm, there's rarely going to be perfect answers. The president has said that so often. But also I think it needs to be said that most, if not all actions, will be imperfect. But inaction is more often than not the most imperfect. So in my judgment, major change is the only course. And this will ine inevitably in a democracy bring a clash of ideas. And from my experience going back uh, decades, the clash has now been intensified by the loss of moderates within Republican ranks. A few of you may remember uh, Jenny does. Several decades ago, I tried to be elected governor of Michigan against a moderate Republican, uh, Bill Milliken, who has become a good friend of mine. And if I might say so, he and I today are much closer in ideas than he is to those dominant in today's Republican Party. And so health care became the arena for this intense battle of ideas and rhetoric. The Obama administration inherited a health care system the best in terms of innovation and almost the worst among industrial nations in terms of cost. The unsuccessful Clinton reform effort was followed by eight years of inaction as cost and coverage problems grew still worse. So we acted. Basic change creates resistance, and the nation heard claims of impending disaster similar to those heard surrounding the passage of Social Security and Medicare. And the staff and I pulled together some of those quotes from the 60s and the 30s. Uh, they're not included here because of the lack of time, but they sound so similar, those uh, claims and arguments of decades ago to those heard today. Well, it turned out that pronostications were wrong. The clash, and I emphasize this, has not immobilized but energized those of us in the majority. This happens, I think, when people do what they believe in and believe their actions will be in the best American tradition, spreading the wings of opportunity and of community. 
Well, we returned last week, and jobs is our number one issue, very much before this committee. The deeper the recession, the longer is the traditional lag, as we know, in job creation. Actions have led to significant stabilization, and I think there are more and more signs. When I talk to some of you in the business world, the first question I ask, is it a bit better? And most of you say yes, a bit better. But clearly we have to undertake additional efforts to spur job growth. So, as you know, the President signed the hire bill uh, last week, and it has some real incentives for small businesses. And the House approved, unfortunately, with only a handful of Republican votes, the Small Business and Infrastructure Tax Act to assist small businesses and extend the very successful Build America bond program, which experts have call, called, and I quote, one of the economic recovery efforts, biggest successes. Well, we heard a, uh, had a hearing last week on green jobs, and a distinguished reporter who is here was there, I think, for all of it. It went from 10 until 6 p.m. It was a useful hearing, I think, and we're now looking at further legislation. And several business uh, spokespersons had something to say that I thought was so significant from GM and Dow about the need for an active public partnership with the private sector to develop technologies shaping our future. And these two people said it could not have happened only relying on markets themselves. And it was this that characterized programs, as so many of you know, in the Recovery Act, the battery grants which have helped to spark the beginning of a renaissance in Michigan and elsewhere industrially. It's interesting, as I talk to my colleagues, how many of my colleagues say, I come from the state that is going to be the new center of electric battery development. So many. And I look at them and I say, you know, it's Michigan. <laughs> no, they say, it's Ohio. Or someone told me, it's Delaware. I know Joe Biden's from Delaware, so I took that uh, somewhat seriously. <laughs> but also, this public-private partnership is the underlying premise of the R&D tax credit, which is at the heart of the extenders bill that uh, has passed both houses. So these bills are being worked on right now, and to anticipate a question on this, uh, I think these bills, the extender bills and the small business infrastructure job bill, that together we need to not only work on them, but pass them before Memorial Day. So let me say a few words about safeguards uh, for workers. I think those who reported knew that as I handled the unemployment comp bill just last week, I was really disturbed, that's a mild word, at the attack on the bill or the resistance to it, uh, first among Senate Republicans and then most, fortunately, not all of the House Republicans. There are today twice the numbers of long-term unemployed compared to any other time on record. It's usually been a bipartisan effort, but the claim among Republicans is that we cannot afford it because of the deficit. These, these members seem to have discovered fiscal responsibility when it comes to unemployed workers, but now when it comes to paying for tax cuts for the very wealthy. So we have to extend unemployment and COBRA. We also have acted in the Recovery Act for those dislocated by trade. And fortunately, in the Recovery Act, we began some long-needed reforms of the unemployment comp system. Also, we include, included, and this has been somewhat overlooked, some important improvements in TANF to provide funding to help states with rising welfare loads. And it's really interesting. I do suggest those in, you, in the media look at what the states have been doing with these several billion dollars in this TANF program. Some of the most conservative states 
have essentially used TANF monies to put people back to work. And fortunately for the disabled, Congress has provided increased funding uh, for the disabled. In Michigan today, the average weight for those who are disabled or claim to be disabled uh, is over three years. And there's no health care. These are people we don't see. It's hard to find them. They're covered by privacy requirements. Uh, but um, we need to do better. Remember, two-thirds of the claims that are being litigated eventually are approved and people are waiting all of these years falling deeper and deeper into despair and some even dying before the litigation can proceed. So let me say a word about tax policy. The rumors Ways and Means has jurisdiction over taxes. Just a brief word about the estate tax. It expired. We're four months into the year without resolution of it. I find this uncertainty unacceptable and unfair. I wrote this out and I had to double check it. I'm a lawyer. I did a bit of estate planning, but I don't think I fully realized all of the ramifications. For instance, many wills are written to leave as much to the children as is below the estate tax threshold with the rest going to the surviving spouse. Today, today that means that the children may well be left with nothing. Well, just a word about the expiring tax cuts. During the last economic expansion from 01 to 07, the top 1% of Americans received two-thirds of the increase in national income while the middle class incomes essentially stagnated. The divergence of income we have seen in the last decade means we should keep the middle income tax cuts and let those for the very wealthy expire. And I think that is going to eventually happen. And indeed, this was the course set by statutory PAYGO. And PAYGO not only sets that course, but is a vital step for fiscal responsibility. And just a word, once we handle these issues, we can turn to our, our attention to reform of the tax code. Uh, Charlie Rangel, as you know, months ago unfolded a, unveiled a comprehensive tax reform proposal, and I think we'll continue to work on it. So just a few words about trade. As some of you know, I've been somewhat involved in this and have some deep feelings about it. The Bush administration took a hands-off approach to trade policy. Those of you who report on it have heard me say that so many times. It was wedded to the view that the more the trade, the better, no matter its terms or contents. In my judgment, we need to both expand trade and spread its benefits more broadly broadly and be sure that our workers and businesses are playing on a level playing field. That's been the expression most importantly of the president, talking about the need for it to be reciprocal, not just a one-way street. And the administration has taken important steps to carry that out. A brief word and you may want to talk more about uh, the specific trade agreements that the administration inherited from the Bush administration, Korea, Colombia, and Panama. There's no doubt they contain some important positive aspects, but also some flaws. And when they were being negotiated, we made clear to those negotiating that they had to be changed. They weren't, and now we need to fix them. Last week, we held a bipartisan meeting of key House members, four of us, Republicans and Democrats, with the new USTR leadership working on the Doha negotiations. It was a constructive session and maybe was a slight glimmer of hope 
that we can begin to revive a bipartisan trade policy. So we're going to be working together, I hope, on a broad range of issues. And perhaps you want to talk more about this. We'll see the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement and also the issues of currency. We are going to actively offer our support for the administration's G20 initiative to address unsustainable global trade and financial imbalances, including addressing currency policies. China's currency is clearly undervalued and is an important cause of our country's major trade deficits. And I'll continue to be working with this administration over the next few months as it addresses in the G20, as it must, the currency issue. So let me conclude with just a few thoughts. So many of the pending issues of 210 are in the jurisdiction of our committee. Moving ahead responsibly and responsively, and I emphasize both, we have held hearings, for example, on China currency, and recently on energy and technology issues. And we had recently a committee markup of the most recent job bills, bill, and we'll continue to do that. And just this last comment. Much is being reported now about the political outlook for November, and as I look about, that's true of many of you. Congressional Democrats know that repairing the damage of the combination of harmful Bush administration policies in many key areas and its inaction in others and replacing them with sound policies require both persistence and patience and a vigorous dialogue with the American people. We know that responding to the dynamics of a perfect storm, in quotes, means resistance as a part of progress. We have confidence that the path forward we are charting builds on the finest American traditions and that we are going to succeed. Thank you very much. <clears throat> And thank you, Chairman Levin. In keeping with the wide range of topics that your committee oversees, we have a wide range of topics for questions that have been submitted today, and I, I see more are still coming in. So starting off with one of the topics that you address, health care reform. Um, it's being said that the health care reform package used all of the low-hanging fruit in terms of revenue raisers. Um, where can the committee look for new sources to pay for new investments? Okay, by the way, I, I welcome your questions, and I know it's the tradition here to have written questions. So I'm sorry you don't have to identify yourself who asked the question. <laughs> and also, I love the back and forth, including the chance to disagree with me after my answer. But uh, I follow the traditions of this distinguished press club, including a red cord that I'm totally unused to. Um, but anyway. Um, no, I mean, I don't know how low-hanging it was, uh, but it was there. Uh, black liquor was used so many times that uh, we almost became drunk on it. Um, what are we going to use instead? Because we have the extenders bill that's been renamed, fortunately, as a jobs bill by the Senate. And we have our small business bill that is over there and has pay-fors, including those relating, relating to tre treaty shopping. And there's some resistance to it. Uh, also over there is a bill, our, our um, major bill, with carried interest in it. <clears throat> All of these have been controversial. I met with Senator Baucus last Monday, and we had a really uh, thorough and I think very constructive discussion 
about where we're going to find the pay for us. And I just want to assure everybody who's here that we're going to take a serious look at those provisions and others. We have to pay for them. It's required by PAYGO and by fiscal responsibility. Not the unemployment comp provisions, the COBRA provisions, the STR provisions that are essentially covered by PAYGO. And I am hopeful that as we discuss this, that the Republicans will drop their opposition to extending unemployment comp unless it's paid for. We have not paid for extensions of unemployment compensation or for COBRA. And PAYGO provides, as I said, the structure to proceed. However, the rest of the provisions have to be paid for, and I'm not sure where the fruit is. Some people think it's sour. Some may think it's rotten. But the main thing is, on those two examples and others, and we're working on others, we're going to find pay-fors using some intelligent discussion, going beyond the labels to see where we can find provisions that provide resources with equity. With equity. Thank you. And just to note your respect of press club traditions, including the red line, we do know you're very popular among the tax and trade lobbyist community in this town, and we do try to keep the paparazzi away from you out of respect as their speakers. Um, a lot of our questions had to do with the A's, um, the various free trade agreements that, that have been waiting for some sort of approval ratification to the congressional process. Have you received any signals from the White House they intend to send you any of the three pending free trade agreements this year? Do you think the Korea free trade agreement could be fixed to address your concerns, especially about automobiles? Okay, let's take them quickly one at a time. Um, Panama, oh, by the way, we've been working on these for, for years. Um, it was a year and a half ago, I think, that I spent two Saturdays at the Panama Embassy with a staff person discussing with the Panamanians the free trade agreement. In those days, the then administration did not want to negotiate labor and environmental provisions. And so essentially, the Democratic trade staff and I did the negotiating or the discussing. That's changed. It's up to USTR to do the negotiating. And now we have a USTR which will do that. The issues that we discussed with, uh, with Panama then related to their coming in compliance with basic, which will do that. The issues that we discussed with uh, with Panama then related to their coming in compliance with basic ILO worker rights provisions. The tax haven issue wasn't as prominent then as it is now. Essentially what has to happen with Panama is to implement what we discussed a year and a half ago and to pass a tax haven provision. They do that and I think then we will be in a position to move forward. Let me say a word about Korea. I said, and I wasn't the only one, to the administration negotiators that they had to open up the Korean market for our industrial goods. They ship 700,000 cars a year here. We ship less than 10,000. They have a wall against our exports industrially. American refrigerator manufacturers cannot sell their basic refrigerator in Korea. You can go into Lowe's Home Depot and buy several Korean made refrigerators. It's a one way street and we told them it had to change and they had to provide for those changes. They failed to do so. And so they went ahead with a path that was sure to fail. We had warned them. Can it be fixed? The answer is yes. And fortunately, 
when our two presidents met, the Korean president and President Obama, for the first time Korea indicated a willingness to sit down and talk about fixing it. I want to say a quick word. I see you're shuffling your cards. I'll try to be brief. I want to say a word about Colombia. Our trade policy under this administration essentially says this. You have to expand trade, but to do so in a way that spreads its benefits. That's better for those countries and better for ours. With Colombia, and this was the battle we had uh, over CAFTA, Latin American countries in too many cases essentially have these deep disparities in terms of income and opportunity. You can't grow middle classes under those circumstances. Middle classes are the ones who buy our goods, basically. So there's a basic point in worker rights, in English worker rights. It's not because anybody is, is standing up for any particular interest group in this country. We're standing up for our businesses and workers and for the workers in other countries who need to be part of the mix in order f to buy our goods. Today, there's a, an article, just as a coincidence, I clipped it. My brother and I, you who are reporters, we clip you endlessly. And we're so much raised the same way, we stuff them in our pockets the same way. So I stuff this in my pocket. It comes from the Washington Post. Colombia struggles to reduce poverty. The gap between rich, poor continues as wealthy get, get much of the USA. I went on to Colombia myself, as I like, did when I went to China myself or went to the Catholic countries myself to see firsthand what the conditions were. I met with people who work in, 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 in the sugar industry. There, essentially, workers are totally deprived of their ability to be participants and have a say. They've set up these so-called cooperatives that are essentially dummy outfits. And workers go from cooperative to cooperative, being paid for by some entity, unable to be able to be a, rate, a major part of the economy. That has to be fixed for their good and our good. I fully understand the importance of opening up the Colombian market. I fully understand that for our workers, our businesses and workers. But we need to have trade agreements that essentially reflect our values, and in the case of workers, basic international labor values. Once that happens, we'll be able to proceed. I understand some gains in security. There also have to be gains in terms of diminishing the, 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 the disparities in income that have so beleaguered the Latin American countries. And I finish with this. My beloved dad, her granddad, uh, loved Latin America, traveled there. We were raised with that feeling of affection. He was the honorary consul general for Honduras in Michigan in the 50s. He, so he, he wanted to find a country that would make him consul. <laughs> so he found Honduras. He stamped five visas a year, I think. But he, he, he felt so deeply about the importance of those countries uh, fully meeting the needs of, uh, of, of, of their, their constituents. That's what this is all about. So in a word, I think we need to proceed. We need to address the outstanding issues. I hope we can do that. One of the frequent arguments made in favor of ratifying these free trade agreements is the need to support strategic allies. How much weight should foreign policy considerations be given when deciding whether to ratify free trade agreements? The answer is some but they're trade agreements. That's the answer. 
I mean, look, uh, we, we know the, we know with, with Korea, for example, the other issues. They're, they're important issues. <laughs> All I suggest is that they not totally overwhelm what is the basic purpose of a free trade agreement. Uh, I'll finish with this. There's the rhetoric in this town about this administration or people like myself being isolationists or Charlie Rangel an isolationist? No. We're people who understand the importance of globalization and who want to make it work. And work, as that article indicates, not for a minority, but for the vast people of that country because it's better for that country and it's better for our country. And that was once the foundation of American policy towards Latin America. And I want it to be revived and I have confidence under this administration it will be. One month ago you chaired a hearing on Chinese currency manipulation after which you concluded that the status quo was unsustainable. Another month has passed, but China's currency has not appreciated against the dollar. President Obama discussed the issue with Chinese President Hu Jintao here in Washington last week, but no promises were made, no timeline was set. What's Congress's role to play in this issue? Is legislation on the currency helpful? And should the Treasury designate China as a currency manipulator in its overdue currency report? The administration has essentially decided on this course to try to resolve the China currency issue multilaterally. When Secretary Geithner and I met uh, two Fridays ago, I think it was, we discussed it at length and he made clear that that was how they were going to go. The G20 are meeting in a couple months. It's clear to me that this administration is endeavoring to try to help bring about a change. China has rigged its currency. It has been part of their overall strategy. It has to change. They're going to try to use a multilateral process to help bring that about. If it doesn't work, the U.S. will act. I have no doubt about it. I think the administration will act and I think the Congress will act. In the meanwhile, congressional pressure, I think, perhaps helps the Chinese understand that the status quo is unacceptable. It has had that imbalance a substantial impact on our businesses and our workers. One can argue endlessly how much is it undervalued. Is it between 15 and 40 percent or 10 and 30 percent? And how many jobs have been lost? All I know is that the Chinese government, and it isn't the only thing, subsidization and other uh, features of it, but the currency has been a major tool for them essentially to get an advantage economically over us. It is far from fair for us. I think it is also unwise for the Chinese to continue doing it that way. So in a word, I think it will change by the end of the G20 meetings. China will make the decisions, will begin to do this, or else will take further steps. We've had several questions relating to the value-added tax, which is a proposal that's been discussed on Capitol Hill. Could you please discuss the pros and cons of a value-added tax, and would such a tax violate President Obama's promise not to impose taxes on people making less than $250,000? You know, I've been listening to this debate. I saw, waiting for the Red Wing hockey game yesterday. I shouldn't have waited. Um, but... Um, I listened to the talk shows, and it was interesting how the value-added tax had gained such uh, prominence. I was somewhat surprised. I, I've heard almost nobody within our ranks discuss it. I, I, I know that one distinguished economist in this town did talk about it, uh, but the administration hasn't. 
Um, so I was somewhat surprised. My guess is that by next week it will be a goner, and that's for good reason. I think it's being raised mostly by the Republicans for political gain. They're trying to label us as a taxer. I suggest not only are they wrong, but they should read Paul Ryan's proposal. He's a Republican, my pal Paul, and he has a value-added tax provision in it. Um, so uh, I don't think it's on the agenda. And so let me suggest that we argue the pros and cons the next time I can come to the press club. Thank you. Under Chairman Rangel, the Ways and Means Committee has put an enormous effort in the last couple of years into putting together a revenue-neutral package of tax reforms that would broaden the overall base and lower <coughs> taxes on U.S. companies and middle-class taxpayers. Given the deficit, is it possible to do a revenue-neutral reform? Does any broad package of tax changes or reforms need to bring in more revenue overall? Well, I think uh, to Charlie Rango's credit, he um, brought earlier uh, some months ago, it was actually many months ago, and I think clearly tax reform has to be a major item on the agenda. As to whether it's neutral or not, I think, um, has to be discussed at a time when we're able to, to focus in on comprehensive tax reform. This isn't the time now. We have immediately in front of us the estate tax issue. We have immediately in front of us the, the 0103 tax cuts. We have to address them. It isn't going to be easy. If there isn't a budget resolution with further reconciliation possibilities, it's going to take 60 votes. Now, if any of you can tell me how we're sure to get that, tell me it will be off the record. I'm not sure how we do that. But that really has to be the focus in the coming months. I'm not sure how we do it. I'm not sure whether they're combined. But that has to be <coughs> the first order of business. And clearly, comprehensive tax reform is an issue for next year, not this year. Is it realistic to believe that individual tax increases can be limited only to high-end taxpayers when the Bush tax cuts expire at the end of the year? Uh, yes. <laughs> Do you think all taxes are the same? If not, what kind of taxes serve society best? All taxes. <laughs> no, huh? No, I meant that almost seriously. That's why I love town hall meetings, no? Because the person who asks the question has to announce himself or herself. No, obviously. All taxes aren't the same. By the way, as I was writing <coughs> my remarks, I was reading some material and talking with the most talented staff, if I might say so, in the Congress, the Ways and Means staff. I had the chance uh, to serve on four of the subcommittees over the years of Ways and Means uh, with uh, what's now Income Security, Health, Social Security, where I was able to serve as ranking after our, our much-loved uh, Bob Mitsui passed away, and then, of course, trade. So I, I was just going back with the staff over some materials. And my guess is if, if uh, I gave you a test, and it would be a quickie if I asked all of you to uh, take a piece of paper and answer this question, what percentage of American taxes come from payroll taxes? My guess is that most of you might not pass because some of the rhetoric in this town is that, that most people don't pay taxes. People don't say income taxes, they say taxes. But a very 
It's well, well over 40 and perhaps over 45 percent of our taxes come from payroll taxes, which virtually everybody does pay. So the answer is no. Uh, all the uh, taxes are far from the same. And my guess is that we will continue to have an income tax which is progressive. We will look at taxes like payroll taxes and try to see if we can uh, make some adjustments. It isn't clear. We have Social Security and Medicare to look at. We have the health care bill and its tax provisions to look at. Clearly, they aren't all the same. What we have to do in our society is to find ways to make intelligent decisions as to which taxes are the fairest, most equitable taxes. Is there any reason that the U.S. should not put in place a tax on financial transactions similar to the tax on stock trades that the U.K. uses? <laughs> well, let me just quickly <coughs> cover this point because um, I, I thought somebody might ask about the bank tax and the financial transaction taxes. Um, I don't think uh, the financial transaction tax idea is likely to be acceptable. We are now thinking about what we do with what's called the bank's bank tax. As I think you know, the TARP legislation essentially required in the next few years for the administration to come up with suggestions as to how any gap excuse me, in terms of repayment, is filled. It now looks like 60, 70 percent of the TARP funds will for sure be repaid. I think it's close to that already. Um, there's likely to be a gap, and so it's, it's important to, to figure out how we're going to fill it. And the, the financial re-regulation provision in the Senate has a tax, but different than is being discussed relating to the bank tax. I think one way or another, we are going to consider this issue as to a, a, a financial fee or tax on institutions that benefited from the essential need to rescue our economy. There are various ways to go. Asset versus income, for example. The administration has proposed one path. We have been discussing intensely with the administration the various paths that may be open. If I might say so, this is an example of the importance of the Ways and Means Committee and the importance of our working with the Finance Committee, the importance of our working with the administration, and I hope the importance of working with the minority to try to find out the best way to do this if we're going to do it. And that's what we're in the middle of. And so I expect that those of you in the media are going to be asking us in the next weeks ahead how it's going. And I'll try to tell you. At this point, it isn't clear. Moving to climate change, uh, do you think the carbon tax provisions in the Kerry Graham Energy Bill are workable? What are your ideas for funding climate change legislation? You know, I'm not sure where we're going because it's become so politicized. I voted for the cap and trade provision. By the way, our staff and I put together the provision in terms of border adjustment. It's somewhat related uh, to, um, to, to the other issues, including the VAT tax. Because one of the problems we have with trade is that, as you know, other countries have a tax system that advantages somewhat directly their producers. Our system is more complicated. So we had to be sure in the cap and trade bill that we had a provision so that if other countries did not become a party to a meaningful environmental structure and therefore gained an advantage over us economically, that we had an instrumentality to react. 
It was interesting, if I might say so, and I'll do this quickly, how it immediately got caught up in the polarized rhetoric of trade. They said, in quotes, it was protectionist. Protectionist, what we were doing was saying that if a, other countries tried to get, and there had to be a deliberate effort, to gain an advantage in trade, through pollution, if you want to put it directly, that we would be able to compete. So any energy legislation has to include a sensitivity to who is included and as to what happens if we're competing with those who are not included. So I think the cap and trade bill has met major resistance. <laughs> I think that uh, John, John Kerry and Barbara Boxer and others working with uh, Lindsey Graham may have a way to do this that would work, that was different. All I can say is this, and this gets back to the perfect storm, and it relates, I guess, to the environment. I Look, for my generation, global warming is a threat that we must address in terms of our children and our grandchildren. The assumption is that it will all work out is an assumption that is too dangerous. So I think this will probably not be the year, but maybe so. But if it's not this year, I hope this country will have enough sense to have a sensible discussion of climate issues and not be caught up in what has become so divisive within our rhetoric. <clears throat> we are almost out of time, but before asking the last question, we have a couple of important matters to take care of. First, let us remind our guests and members of future speakers. On April 30th, we will have Secretary Ray Mabus of the U.S. Department of the Navy. And on May 19th, we will be hosting the Honorable Tim Kaine, Chair of the Democratic National Committee, who will discuss his party's prospects in the 2010 elections. Second, the moment we've all been waiting for, we'd like to present our guest with the traditional National Press Club mug. I'll unwrap it. It's real. <laughs> Final question. Um, the Pew Research Center released a survey today that found that four out of five Americans surveyed distrust government. What has to be done to restore that trust, and what role do you see the Ways and Means Committee playing specifically? No, I, I heard those reports, and uh, they're, they're very concerning. Um, I think the first, the first uh, approach has to be integrity. I think that everybody in this country wants legislators essentially uh, to have basic honesty, basic integrity, to be in a position to call it the way they see it after they have talked with all interested parties and with their constituents. I think that anything that undercuts that um, is a serious problem. So I think I would put that um, first. I also think that we have to make clear that, um, uh, that we're shutting nobody out from the debate. I must confess that I find some of the echoes in our present debate somewhat disturbing. However, I think the best answer to that is to listen and to respond. And let me say, lastly, in terms of um, how we handle this issue, in terms of, I think people I think our citizens in this country have felt somewhat shut out. We have this perfect storm, 
we have the feeling among the middle income groups of this country that they essentially have been treading water as they have. And I think we need to respond to what is the feeling of essentially treading water. And it relates to jobs, to jobs, and also I think it relates to it. Uh, this health bill, it's called a health bill, had some important education provisions in it. Also, I think there is a feeling of a need for equity and fairness. And I close with this because I think it's a special charge to the Ways and Means Committee that has jurisdiction over Social Security and health care, Medicare, trade issues where fairness is an issue and also tax policy. I think we in the committee have a solemn obligation to make sure that there is an equitable opportunity for every citizen in the United States. Every citizen in the United States. And why I enjoy so much serving on this committee is that it gives us the opportunity in all of the areas I mentioned to try to make sure that this remains a land of opportunity, and I add the word community. I feel what we have been trying to do, our majority, is to keep that promise of opportunity and of community. And my own judgment is that if we will keep at it, if we'll have open ears and open minds, but also a sense of commitment and determination, that in the end we will be able to respond to those who are skeptics of the way it is today and skeptics of government. Look, I want my constituents to be proud, not of me, really, but of the position I and of the government that I serve. I want to go back and convince them that it can be such. Otherwise, why run? I want to run in an atmosphere that renews trust and renews faith and it renews a sense that it is a government to serve, not to dominate. Thank you very much for having me.